Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim The lecture I'm going to do today is about a commonly seen autosomal recessive neuromuscular condition called spinal muscular atrophy. Let's start with today's presentation. As I said, it's an autosomal recessive neurological condition. I will discuss briefly what does that mean in the next slide. But as I said, it's common. Its incidence is 1 in 10,000 in American population. And the carrier frequency is 1 in 50. So you can imagine by these numbers how commonly we come across these conditions in a neuromuscular clinic. It is because of a mutation involving SMN protein and a gene which is located on the chromosome 5Q13. So there are two uh, genes which are SMN1 and SMN2. This condition is seen when there is a deletion of SMN1 gene. As I said, it's an autosomal recessive condition. It actually means that both parents need to have this mutation to cause the disease in their babies. And when this happened, as you can see through this image, the 25% of the individuals are affected if both the parents carry the gene. And 50% have the carrier status, but they don't have the manifestation of the disease. And 25% of the babies or the next generation will not have the disease. So for this disease to happen, an individual need to have SMN1 mutation happen with SMN1 deletion that there is no functional SMN N protein or messenger RNA to develop that protein, which is a full length protein. And this happens when there's a deletion and there is SMN2, which tries to compensate by producing some of uh, full length SMN protein. But this is with the mutation of and translocation of C with the T. So with this slight change or variation of the exon, there is only 20% of the full length protein which can be functional. And also 80% is actually degraded or truncated, resulting in a small amount of the functional protein. And based on the amount of the small functional protein, these patients have the severity or the manifestation of the disease. For SMN2, there are copy numbers and those can be up to six. The easier way to understand the bigger the copy numbers, manifestation of the disease is gonna be milder. As you can see in this table for SMN1, which is the severe variant or the type, SMN2 is less severe and SMN3 is even less severe manifestation of spinal muscular atrophy. And it all depends on the SMN2 copy numbers. If the copy number is one, which means the there is a only small amount of functional protein, the patient's most commonly gonna have the SMA1 variant or the type of the disease. A patient has two SMN2 copy numbers, most of these patients gonna have SMA1, a small number may have SMA2, and really there could be SMA3. With SMN3 copy numbers, the main manifestation of the disease is 82% of them have SMA2, 20% have SMA1, and a, a good percentage may have SMA3, means milder manifestation of the disease. If a patient has four copy numbers or more, it's gonna be SMA3 or maybe SMA4. So to understand it better in a simple line, it would be higher the copy number of SMN2, the less severe the disease is gonna be in the patient. Coming to the pathophysiology of spinal muscular atrophy, it's a cut section of the spinal cord showing the anterior horn cells and the dorsal root. And from the anterior horn cells, we see the motor root going into the muscle. So what happened is there is motor neuron hyperexcitability resulting in the early death of the motor neurons. And at the same time, there is a neuromuscular junction disruption resulting in impaired development and denervation. So there is a shrinkage of the muscles. Some muscle may try to compensate and hypertrophy. So on histopathological section, what we see is a good number of atrophic fibers and there could be some hypertrophic fibers beside them 
as a, as a histopathological manifestation of the disease. And because of this, there's gonna be uh, uh, disruption of the synaptic uh, level. As I said, when we clinically assess the manifestation or the severity of the disease, the two things that depends um, or kind of give us the prognosis are the age of symptom onset and the motor milestones achieved. And the third thing, as I have already discussed, the copy numbers of SMN2. So SMN1 usually manifests before six months of age. I'm gonna talk more about that. SMN2 usually between the age of six months to 18 months. The SMN3 patients usually present from 18 months to 21 years of age. And the SMN4 patients have the manifestation in the adult age after the 21 years. Now, coming to the more detailed explanation. So there are other variants, as I said, there could be SMA0, there could be SMA4. For SMA0, these patients usually have congenital um, joint contractures at birth, congenital weakness, and neonatal respiratory failure, and they may not survive more than a month. For the patients having SMA1, they have symptom onset before six months of age. They will never be able to achieve sitting as a motor milestone. The copy numbers of SMN2 could be two or three in these patients. And usually the lifespan is less than two years of age. These patients tend to have tongue fish occlusions, respiratory failure, and swallowing difficulty. These patients usually present in the pediatric clinic. The patients who are SMA2, they usually have disease manifestation in six to 18 months of age. They may be able to achieve independent sitting. They may have SMN copy numbers of three or four, and they may have lifespan greater than two years. They also tend to have proximal weakness, tongue fish occlusion, scoliosis, and joint contractures. When I see SMA patients or any neuromuscular condition patients in my clinic, I tend to assess for the congenital joint deformities because that will give me the idea about the chronicity of the weakness, the pattern of the weakness, because as in SMA, there tend to be proximal and axial muscle involvement early on in the disease. Yes, with the progression of the disease, there could be distal muscle involvement as well. So these patients tend to have scoliosis and uh, joint contractures. For SMA3, it has been divided into two further subtypes based on the age group. If it is from 18 months to three years, it's SMA3A. If they present or develop motor manifestations between the age of three to 21 years, we divide them into SMA3B. These patients are able to achieve independent walking. They may have SMN copy numbers of three and four. Usually they live into adulthood. They often lose the ability to walk in later childhood or early adulthood. And as I said, they tend to have scoliosis, which I very commonly like to check on these patients. For patients with SMA4, they tend to have more normal lifespan and they may be able to achieve a mild weakness, but still able to function pretty much normally. The diagnosis of these patients is usually done with a history and examination. In neurology, we stress upon history, history, and history, followed by examination to confirm what we see or suspect on history of these patients. Then we can do a nerve conduction study and electromyography. With the nerve conduction study, we assess the compound motion, motor action potential, and that can give us an idea of the severity of the disease. Again, it's like all the pieces of the puzzle, we try to put them together to understand the disease better. For in patients with SMA3, SMA2, having the copy numbers of three and less, they tend to have reduced compound muscle action potential, and that can also give us the idea of the severity of the disease or the stage of the disease. The confirmation of the diagnosis is done with the genetic testing. As, as we discussed early on, there has to be SMN1 deletion to have this disease. And also we need to understand the copy numbers of SMN2 because that will guide us about the treatment of these patients, which I'm gonna discuss afterwards. More importantly, over the time, because there has been some genetic therapies available in the market, so it is recommended to make SMA testing as part of neonatal screening, which is not as common in Pakistan, but I think it should be part of the policy to include SMA testing in neonatal screening as more and more patients will be diagnosed early on, and earlier treatment has more benefit rather than later, like in most of the neurological conditions. And finally, the management of the complication of these patients, which I'm gonna discuss. When we do the genetic testing, the result 
is presented like this. And as you can see in this particular report for one of my patient, there are two pathogenic variants identified with the deletion of the entire coding sequence in SMN1, which is consistent with the spinal muscular atrophy. Copy numbers are three, which fits with either SMN2 or SMN3. How to manage these patients? As I said, there are, with the passage of time since 2016, there are a few genetic therapies available which can be tried on these patients. I'm gonna briefly talk about those. But more important, which I would like to stress upon is the supportive medical care. Because with that, we can provide the peace of mind to parents, to patient, and also we will be able to provide and sustain life till more therapies are available. Physiotherapy is the core of any neurological condition, especially in patients with neuromuscular diseases. And it has very much importance in terms of avoiding contractures, avoiding complications, respiratory physiotherapy, avoiding pneumonias and respiratory complications, which are usually the most common reason for demise or death in these patients. I will also like to stress upon the social support because that is very important, especially for the family and the understanding of the disease and the prognosis in these patients. And the, the actual reason for doing this lecture is about the community awareness about what's available in the market, what can be done, and what should be the expectation for these patients. So there are three genetic therapies available. As you can guess from the initial slide, when there is an SMN1 deletion, so one course of action was to introduce SMN1, and that is called gene replacement. And the one treatment available for that is with the name onasemnogene. The cost for this treatment is $2.1 million. And you can imagine it is very expensive currently, and it may not be very um, feasible for, for many patients to afford this treatment at this time. But with this treatment, the, usually it can be given before the age of two years. There could be some a liver function derangement. It's an adenovirus-based uh, therapy targeted on SMN1. Uh, there has been studies which have shown promise. I really hope with the passage of time, the cost will come down, but it can be given before the age of two years in patients with SMN. Also with the SMN protein production, which is the second course of action, because with the SMN1 deletion, we are left with the SMN2, which is producing some functional protein, but the main product is dysfunctional or truncated protein, which is degraded later on in the course. So the second course of action was to enhance the production of spinal muscular uh, protein. Within this, there are two treatments available. The first one was nucinersin, which was introduced in December of 2016. It is given as intrathecal injections. After the first four injections, which are given two weeks apart, and the fourth injection is given 30 days apart, it has to be given every four months. But because it is given intrathecally, it needs expertise, and there are chances of low pressure headache. The cost of this treatment at this time is $750,000 per year for the first year, and $375,000 for the years afterwards for the life of the patient. And as you can imagine, it is also very expensive currently. The next treatment is Ristiplam, which enhances splicing efficiency at exon seven, which is the main reason this protein or the, 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 the production of the protein is uh, in a way that it doesn't produce functional protein and degrade it. So with this, the splicing efficiency is increased and we are able to have more functional protein. The current cost for this one is close to $350,000 yearly. The convenience with this medicine is that it is given as a daily oral dosage. And that is very helpful in terms of the taking the medicine on a regular basis, but the cost is still very high. There are many other course of actions which are in the pipeline or in research like the myostatin activation inhibitors, which can enhance muscle function, but there is no FDA approved treatment yet in the market. As I said, treatments are expensive and it's challenging to afford, especially in a third world country or developing countries uh, where almost no patient will be able to afford it. Then we come to the general management of these patients and preventing the complications. 
So the most common, as I said, the skeletal abnormalities, they tend to have scoliosis or worsening of the curvature of the spine resulting in respiratory or breathing difficulty or mobility issues. It can be corrected orthopedically, but that is also gonna cost and take the expertise for the family to understand that is it really needed or not. But it can be prevented or delayed with the help of physiotherapy. As there is a muscle atrophy, so these patients tend to have uh, repeated pneumonias because of respiratory muscle weakness, breathing difficulty, sleeping issues, and because of swallowing issues, they may have nutritional deficiency. For the nutritional deficiency, enteral feeding can be considered, but that will prolong life, but will not change the course of the disease otherwise. But orthopedic and mobility support can be provided, but again, we need to discuss about the life expectancy of the, these patients and what to expect as part of the outcome or functional or the quality of life of these patients. In terms of the supportive care, immunizations are available and it should be done in these patients, including flu vaccination, meningococcal vaccinations, and it shouldn't be avoided. Nutritional management is very important, especially in neuromuscular conditions. As I said, enteral feeding can be considered. Lung and breathing care can be done with a physiotherapy and avoiding complications, especially pneumonias. Rehabilitation and orthopedic management is very important um, to, to delay the abnormalities and complications, but it will not change the whole scheme of things. I think the more important part in that case is the emotional and the social impact and discussion with the family. As the kids are small, if they are if they're uh, grown, uh, if, like an SMN3, naturally we need to involve them in the discussion as well. So physiotherapy should be part of their routine life. It should be core and postural movements, gross limb movements, mobility, and oral functioning. Uh, for the sleep disturbance, they can be uh, uh, given sleep or uh, breathing assistance devices. But more importantly, what we need to understand is that they should be as much part of the community as possible. And it should not become a dilemma for the parents and also for the, for the patient. As I said, I usually talk to my patients and the families and tell them that, see, both parents need to have this mutation. It is not their fault that they have this mutation to pass on the disease. And only 25% of the siblings or the next generation are gonna have the disease. So they need to understand this process. But more importantly, these kids should be able to go to school if they can, especially in SMA3 or SMA4. They need to be involved into activities of daily living, and we should try to provide them emotional support as much as possible. So in summary, SMA is an autosomal recessive disease. It was fatal in the past, but now treatment is available, which is yes, very current, expensive currently, but with the passage of time, like in usual pharmaceutical industry, the costs do come down. And as there is more and more competition in the market, I hope this will come down in the next few years to months. Early diagnosis is possible, and it should be part of the neonatal screening, and that is the key to early treatment. Gene therapy is available. General care of patient and community awareness is still the key to handle the disease and its social impact. I hope this lecture will be helpful for neurology residents, uh, general physicians to understand spinal muscular atrophy and tend to refer these patients to either neurophysician or neuromuscular subspecialist early on. So the course of the disease and potential treatment of options can be discussed and family can be guided about that. Thank you very much.